Hi, and welcome to Board Game Opinions. I'm Mark Windle. I'm Jonathan Hicks. And this is an in-depth review of Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth that we've just completed the whole campaign. So this is... Yes. We haven't done the whole thing tonight. Yes. <laughs> we've been playing over a series of weeks, and tonight we finished the final mission. So, Journeys in Middle-Earth is very Lord of the Rings. I wouldn't say it's a dungeon crawl as such, because there's a lot of moving around an overworld as well as... Some dungeony sort of areas and caves, but it, it's nice. Yes, yeah. normally in a dungeon crawl, you're moving. It's very much fight move, fight yeah. move. But yeah, there's a lot of interacting with people or searching locations. Yeah, it gives you a little hints. Oh, there might be a, an item. There's a glistening in this bush or something like that. Or there's a random pile of books here and stuff like that on the map, which are all done by these tokens, which are nice. But I guess the initial comparison people are going to say is the uh, not Arkham Horror. Mansions, it's of, Mansions Madness. of Madness, which because yeah. it's a very, very driven by the app, which we will come to in a little while. But yeah, yeah it's not quite as dungeony focused as that, as you are spanning an overworld more so than little and more detailed on the ground, like room to room. Though there is other bits that is the battle map, which again, we shall cover yes. in a little while. We'll come on to that a bit later. So, the first thing I'm going to talk about briefly is just the components, which I mean, the component quality is good. Yeah. I'm not sure it's their best, but it is good. It's fancy flight, so yeah. you can know what you're getting there. Um, card stock on the various tiles is very nice. Yeah. Artwork Linen really finishes. Good. Yeah, card's great. You told me all the artworks from the uh, card game mainly. Is it? A lot of the artwork has been taken from uh, the LCG, the Lord of the Rings um, living card game. But uh, there is some artwork I've not seen before. Um, and the miniatures are fine, you know, as miniatures go. I think we've been spoiled a bit in the past couple of years, haven't we, with some amazing Kickstarters with super-duper miniatures. These are good miniatures. Yeah. They're not amazing, but they're good. I mean, I do notice they're a slightly softer plastic than even Fancy Flight of regular use, so the details slightly softer. Yeah. And they still look great and on the table, particularly the actual hero miniatures, which do seem to be in the harder plastic. Yes. But these are softer than those, so you've got a slightly sharper detail on, on the heroes than the monsters. For our campaign, I took Legolas. Yeah, and I took Gimli, which made sense as a two-player yeah. campaign we thought of the start. Ultimate duo. Okay. So yeah, components good, fancy flight, what do you expect? Yeah. So, rules and setup. Would you like to demo the app? Because I think that handles so much of the of the rules and yes. setup, it's amazing. If you've played Mansions of Madness, the second edition, you'll be very familiar with this. Um, but essentially, the app tells you a lot of what to do. So, you pick your scenario. Obviously, in the base game, there's like one main campaign that comes yeah. with it. Um, there are possible expansions, we'll talk about that later. But um, you kind of pick your campaign, and then typically you're going to be picking your heroes. Uh, there's going to be some oh, uh, uh, difficulty level here. I think we just want to pick normal difficulty level. And you're going to be picking your heroes at some point. So we'll pick a slot to save in. And then you're going to choose some heroes. So you've got Aragorn, Berevor, Bilbo, and a whole pile of different heroes. So you pick a different, a couple of different heroes. We went for Legolas and Gimli. And then typically you're going to get some starting items. Now there's quite a lot of items in the game. Yes. There's a huge deck of them. Like these are get. them all. And there's a really nice upgrade system with it as well. Uh, but they give you some basic starting items. So typically you each get a weapon of some kind and then maybe a bit of armor. So as Legolas, I got a cloak and I think you got a I got shield. a basic, uh, I think I got a basic mail. Okay. Know. So an axe. So you get your starting items um, and then you sort of launch into it. Uh, we're going to have to pick a name, don't we? We won't worry about that. The theme is very well done in the game, I think. So you get a kind of intro, uh, some flavour text for each of the scenarios, and then typically it's going to show you, first of all, what kind of map it is. They have these um, journey maps. You sort of follow the progress on the map here. But these journey maps which use the tiles that kind of tessellate together, or it could be, as we said, a battle map. So let's just see if I can show you how this works for the first one. Okay, yes. Eventually, there's a lot of stuff for me to get through. It's very clear though, so yeah. there's never there's never really rules looking up uh, at this point. Well, we've got to pick some roles. Um, you get to pick a kind of class, I suppose it is, for each of the heroes. Um, so you've got burglar, captain, uh, guardian, hunter, musician, <laughs> or pathfinder. And they are important for your decks of yeah. cards. Uh, we should perhaps take a moment just to talk about the decks of the cards. Yes. This is really one of the main mechanics in the game. 
in Mansions of Madness, the way you kind of play the games, you're, whether you're fighting or exploring or whatever you're doing, you're trying to get successes and you do that by rolling dice. In this one, there's no dice at all. And the way you get the successes is by using these decks of cards. Now you build these decks of cards from a basic deck plus the class deck according to which class you choose. You then shuffle it up, yep. and then typically when you need to pass a test, you reveal a certain number of cards. So my wisdom skill, for example, is three, so that means if I have a wisdom test, I'll be drawing three cards. And there are certain success symbols that you're looking at on the top left of the card. Um, there are also kind of like semi-success symbols. So some of them, like the orange star, this is a terrible draw, I can swear all my successes. <laughs> There's like an orange star thing, which is a guaranteed success. Or you get this leaf symbol, and with the leaf symbol you can spend inspiration to convert that into a success. And it actually works really well. It means the inspiration tokens that you get are very valuable. You get them from killing monsters, you get them from exploring terrain. But deciding exactly when you want to cash those in to give you the extra successes uh, is really key. Um, but prior to doing the tests and having your turn, you always get to scout. And the scouting... It's really nice. Yeah, this is one of the best things in the game. You shuffle your deck and you draw a certain number of cards. If it says Scout 2, which is typical, you draw two cards. And then you decide what to do with them. You can either put them both on the top or the bottom of your deck or one each. Um, so, for example, this card I've drawn has a success on it. So I'm going to put it on the top of my deck, which means the first test I do on my turn is guaranteed to have at least one success in it. So that's really helpful. Um, the other one, I could put it on the bottom of the deck if it's not something I want. But each card also has a special ability on it, which you can kind of add to a tableau. You get to add one each time you scout. Uh, so in this case, it says, when I test my wit, I can add an extra success. And that's like a permanent skill that buffs my character. And they do all kinds of things. They'll help you in combat, won't they? Yeah, I mean, they, I can think of things where I was a guardian, so I could guard, prevent damage to me or you if you're close by. Yeah. Um, because we only play two classes, I'm assuming there's a range one, like the Thieves one, probably quite interesting or whatever it was the, the burglar yeah that's right so they uh, they cover the most widest range of they give you the feel of the character i think it's like yeah, a guardian yeah. is a lot of preventing damage being stern and standing in the, in the way of danger while i expect like i said the pathfinder might find ways of helping you move quicker across the map we don't know because we didn't get, we haven't played those but i suspect yeah no that, that is why i did read yeah. up about the pathfinder one um so sometimes you see if you draw a card with a success when you scout it's like I really want the success on the top, but sometimes the special abilities are pretty good. It's like, oh, well, maybe I'll be better off with the special ability now. So there's always interesting decisions. Every round, you know, we each take a couple of actions, yeah. a couple of turns, but then it resets. The darkness does some stuff, and then we get to scout again for the next round. So you're doing the scouting thing a lot, and it's just a really interesting method. Yes, rather than just having, I mean, I've got, I'm this good, I'm going to roll some dice. I know I can weight my deck towards succeeding based on what I do. I just have the decision whether to take, hold the card or not. I at least have an idea what might come up, which give me, gives me some foresight and give me some preparation. And I think it's just different. And also, because you not grade your deck over time, I can yeah. weight it towards more successes. So at the end of each scenario, you're gaining experience effectively as you fight the monsters and explore and things and you can spend the experience to add extra cards from your kind of original deck here to buff your deck so it's got more successes in, for example, um, which is really nice. And it's the thematic as well. Yes. You know, each of the things are either people who are helping you or the items in some way, but um, it makes sense. It's really nice. Yeah, I mean, set of itself is tricky in the fact that you've got to hunt down a load of tiles. <laughs> yes. Which, well, that's always going to be the nature of this style of game, though. Yeah, yeah, indeed. But uh, yeah, a bit of a bit of a loan screen. But at the actual rules, I did find with this game in particular, a lot of a lot of the fantasy flight games with a two rule book system. I have to read. I read the the start one, and then I still end up flicking through the second one. Yeah. In this one, I just read the start one, uh, let the the app take me through most of it, and then any actual issues are locked up in that book, which how it yeah. should be used. Yeah, yeah. But I found with a lot of them, I still end up wanting. I should probably read the list of actual the detailed version of it because yeah. just to be sure it wasn't an issue with this i was yeah. happy just from reading the how to play book so i don't know if you can see but effectively it tells you which map tile to dig out you sort of put it in the middle and then you might add extra tiles or you might put like there are search tokens that go on certain spaces that basically says something is interesting in that location and it'll tell you what it might say the trees are rustling in a funny way maybe you should investigate um but then you can 
explore, and here there you go, and here's another tile it says add on here, but it doesn't do it all, you just have a few to start with, and as you move from tile to tile, you kind of tap on the tile, and it might reveal more tiles nearby. There's a kind of, if I drag this, if you can see it, there's like a fog of war type thing, which is showing you where other tiles might appear later. So that works really well. Yeah, I think that's quite a good plan as well they've done with that. Knowing where the tiles are likely to go, come helped us at least when setting up the initial tiles, less going, we now need to move all the tiles over here because the huge chunks appear over here. I know it gives away a little bit what's coming, but it makes so much easier when you're, when you're playing on the table, oh. just to have an idea we're generally going in that direction. And shall we show the battle map quickly? Yes, place? let's get those. You've got them now. So there's actually two of them, and they're double-sided, and effectively it gives you like a tactical skirmish map. So I'll just dig one of these out here if we clear this out of the way. But essentially, after you put that there, the app then shows you where to put various things of interest. So there might be a river running through a certain location here, or there might be a wall in a certain place. Fog in the middle. What could be inside the <laughs> fog? Uh, rocks and things and fire pits. But a lot of these features affect the battle. Typically, you put your characters on here, there's some monsters up here, yeah. and you're moving around fighting. But for example, you can get cover behind rocks. Um, when you try and cross water, it ends your movement as soon as you've moved. Yeah. Things can hide. There's a negative effects to these. There's holes that oh, that's right. you don't want to. You have to take a risk if you if you walk through that tile because you might fall down the hole. I think the fire generally helps you as you can push things into it, I guess. Yeah. You had like statues that you could topple onto things and all yeah. sorts of. I think that's very really nice because it just it's the bit that takes away we're going over the real map, like the bigger world, but then when there's an actual boss encounter and like that, it gives yeah. you that drawn in on the spot. And the, the train, well basic is nice. I wouldn't it makes it much better than just a flat map with very little terrain there. Yeah. And when you see the battle map on the app it actually shows you the walls and the bits as like 3D Rendered, structures. Yes. So they look really nice, it's great. I think I would get a bit bored if I was just doing the battle map over and over again, it was yes. just fighting. But equally, if we were just wandering around on the land each time, I'd get a bit bored with that as well. The variety switching between them works really well. You know, you do a bunch of the stuff on these journey maps, then you move to the battle map, it's like, yeah, let's do some fighting, but then you go back and do a bit more exploring. So I thought that was great. Yeah. So, I mean, we've got the general playability of this game. It is it is still a lot of us moving around and, and searching and stuff, but I think what they managed to do is really good. I oh. think they, the writers in particular have done a really, really good job at getting the Lord of the Rings feeling. Yeah. I do feel like I'm in the Lord of the Rings world, and, that, and that's the big thing, is that I want to feel like Gimli, and there's orcs, and there's trolls, and there's goblins... There's a lot of flavour text, so when an orc comes up and hits you, it's not just like take three damage, it's the orc tries to come at you from the side and swings his axe around, uh, and there's, it just feels like the theme comes through in everything. Yes. Every time you do anything, there's some flavour text to read, it's well written, and the theme, as Mark says, really comes through. Yeah, I mean, as though we were, we were all to be reading out the flavour text that directly affects our characters, which yeah. just gave it that switch between. I guess you could have, in theory, somebody read out all the narrative, but they'd like, if they'd pre-record the voice, that'd be a lot of voice work. It'd be yeah. nice, but I don't think there it was There are some bits that have been pre-recorded, yes. aren't there? But most of it you're reading yourself. <laughs> but there must be tens of thousands of lines yeah. of text in there. And they're like, they are talking about real places in on like the continent, and it, you've heard of these places yeah, before, yeah. And, and that just makes such a difference. It's well-researched. Yes, and it's very, very Lord of the Rings. I mean, I think Fantasy Flight have got that on anyway with all the other stuff they've done. But it's, an, it's nice to do something like that, and it still works so well. Mm. What did you think to the timer mechanism that it plays with when you're doing your actions, which I think is a very big part of this game? So in certain scenarios, you're trying to make your way across the map, and there might be some bad guy up to some evil plan or something, and there's a t it says you need to hurry to stop yeah. him accomplishing his plan, whatever that might be. And there's not it's not like there's a, a, a time counting down in terms of like you've got 20 minutes or something. It's done effectively in terms of actions. Mm. But there's this threat counter that's usually counting up above the bar. And every round, after you've taken some actions, the threat goes up by a certain amount. But there are things you can do on the map to reduce how much threat there is or how quickly the threat goes up. So that's really nice. You do have this sense of urgency. Yeah. 
but you're kind of aware that a lot of the things on the way could be really helpful. You know, there might be a, a search token here that indicates, as you say, something glistening yeah. in the bushes. And it's like, oh, this could be really useful for us for mm -hmm. this particular scenario, maybe. But is it just, you know, a bit of water or something? Is it a waste of time? Because yeah. you do feel that time. Some of them, I think there has been the one that is just, and something happens, no effect. Or yeah. like, no, and you're like, ah, oh, I should have. Which you do feel the little bit of pressure. I mean, if you can see at the top, it might be hard to see, but the, it actually gives you a number. When you hit that threat, something will happen. Oh, up here, yes. Yeah, so essentially, you know, you've got, you, there is a, a way of working out how quickly threat goes up on the map, which is, in things that send the rule book, it's basically four plus the number of unsearched tiles, which will have essentially those on. Yeah. And then occasionally you get these other markers that go down on there. In fact, it's the reverse side of this. And they will be more dangerous like enemy things that you have to clear off the map. So while you can know what sort of time you've got, which it, which I think is still good. I know it's slightly gamery, because you go, yeah. if I do, if I clear this number of tiles, I won't trigger the event. I still think it ultimately adds the pressure to keep moving forward. Yeah, because otherwise you can move very slowly and carefully and do everything. Yeah. But you just can't because every tile you haven't explored causes the threat to go up faster, yeah. which means if you take too long, the threat just ramps up and ramps up and you lose. Once it gets to the, if the bar fills up, you lose the game, so. Yeah, I mean, there's been times when we've tried to push forward and we're like, we'll just clear this one tile to keep it, to keep threat low, to lower it down. And then we uncover four more tiles and just yeah. go, oh no, it's, gonna, it's awful now. Because you don't know when you're actually going to trigger those other tiles appearing. Yeah, you yeah. know, if it's the one next to them, it's probably going to do it. But often they chain several down. Yeah, it's yeah. like, oh dear. Uh, but I like that system. Like I said, we've always said the card system's really good. I do think I prefer it ultimately just to rolling dice. I do. I think the fact the levelling makes it a lot more interesting. I do feel like I'm developing a character. Uh, actually, going back to what I said on the map, the little things are quite important because they often give you lore. And as your lore goes up, it's what lets you upgrade weapons. Because yeah. you don't spend lore. It's a case of once you hit a certain level, you're, locked, it they? tells you you can now take this better version of your weapon. Yeah. So you do want to keep doing the little things, at least some, because it yeah, helps you right. get them better. So it's not just a case, I'm just going to do the things that will succeed this mission, because you will be get you'll be behind the curve on your levelling. So in some missions, if you kind of play it well... So that you know you kill the baddies quickly or something, you can then take more time to accrue this lore, which ultimately is going to help you level up your character faster. So there's a nice balance there, but at the same time, you're always aware we don't want to take too much yes. time because we might lose the scenario. I think the only other main thing I think about is the fear and damage system that you take, yeah. which essentially you'll say uh, you get hit, you take maybe two fear and two damage. Uh, and much like uh, the Mansions of Madness, you can take them face or face down. If they're face up, they sometimes have no effect, but sometimes have really nasty effects. It's a risk. Often you can use items to prevent some of this. Yeah. But you're obviously using your you've only got a certain number of uses on these items. Do I hold off and wait till later? Lots of nice decisions. It works really well. And then when you finally hit one of your limits, you go into a kind of not very mini game, but you essentially need you to get pass a certain down, don't you? You certain have to pass a certain number of tests. Otherwise, you fail. Yeah. If you succeed, you get to get rid of all of them. But then if you get back to that point again, the value you need to succeed is even higher. So it's nasty, and it isn't. you, you really are nervous at the point if you ever get there. Oh, you yeah. need to succeed this. Because if one of you dies, it just ends the mission. Yeah. That's it. So, And that I think that happened to us once, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, we did It can be quite well. punishing, but there, as you say, there was a few times when we got knocked down, had to pass this critical test, and managed to succeed. So... I think most of the time you'll be able to get up, but as you say, you're always aware there is that danger, yes. and it's a very real danger, which is nice. So, uh, what would be your best comparison to the games? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it has a lot yeah. in common with Mansions of Madness, and you yeah. can't really avoid talking about that. It also obviously draws from Arkham Horror, yeah. and the whole with the fear and the damage things, and trying to balance those two things. Having the set of um, skills and might, wisdom, agility, and things and requiring a certain number of successes. All of that really, I guess, comes ultimately from Arkham Horror. Yes. But they have refined and improved it quite a lot. As I say, with the card, the deck system, really, really like it. If you like Mansions of Madness, and you like the Lord of the Rings theme... This is a no-brainer. Yeah, absolutely. It's... I don't even know why you're watching any more of the view, but if you have... 
I mean, I love Mansions of Madness, the second edition. Um, I think this is better. Yes. So it's. I mean, the, I think the one thing, thing to be aware of is a campaign. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, uh, we're not sure how the actual number total. We play a certain number. There may be different numbers of missions depending on your choices throughout, yes. which is quite interesting. That is nice. It, but you've got a lot of content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This took us weeks to play through it, at doing three or four in a session. Yeah, in per night. And it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, you get a lot for your money, which is good. Maybe in the future you'll get some shorter what, like campaigns, maybe like two, three sessions rather than yes. like, rather than the length that we played to. One big plus for this is that the scenarios are not too long. No. Mansions of Madness, some of them can go on for hours and hours. Three, four hours, plus like there's some that specifically yeah. say this is a long scenario. But these, I don't think any of them were longer than an hour and a half, and most of them you could do comfortably in an hour probably. Um, I so, liked that as well. Yeah. It was short, sharp, snappy. Really nice. Didn't, didn't know my stokes welcome. Made me on completing a scenario want to jump straight into the next scenario That's rather right. than be drained because I've just done a really long one yeah yeah oh yeah actually one thing thing about that about speed and snappiness is in Mansions of Madness if I'm on the wrong side of the map I'm on the wrong side of the map and it's going to take me ages to get to you yeah in this because specifically with the overworld this is never going to be a problem the battle map it's only a few spaces but on this you can move at a rate that I can generally catch you up in two turns yeah yeah it's and nice. that's really nice I never feel like I'm out of, I'm going too far off the track to do something small and I can't catch it with a party yeah and that's nice I, it's, um, I do I did find that problem in Mansions of Madness just being in the wrong place at the wrong time and yeah yeah so slow to move around it feels easier than Mansions of Madness as well. Yeah, I'm mm. pretty sure it's definitely easier. Um, and maybe that's partly the theme. Mansions of Madness, you're sort of expecting it to be really difficult. Yeah. You're up against the odds. In this one, you're the heroes and everything else. I still feel they balanced it well. It never felt like a walkover, but we succeeded most missions without too much trouble. Yes. So in many ways, it's not about can we succeed or can we fail? It's about the adventure. It's just enjoying the story and seeing it develop and the various explorations you're doing and the monsters you're fighting. There is actually a difficulty level on setup as well. Oh, yes, that's true. So we just played the normal difficulty because I'd already been mm. forewarned that the, the the hard difficulty is actually difficult. Oh, okay. And so I was like... I'd well, want, that's good then. That we played the normal is just and like, we would, it was pitched perfectly. Yeah, if I yeah. wanted a real challenge, we'd have got to the more difficult level, but... Yeah. I enjoyed it at that level. I oh. don't think I wanted it any more stressful than it was because it, it was it was still always fun. And yeah, I don't yeah. mind it not being super tough and have it thinking I might have to redo... Because you can't even redo missions in this. You fail, you just fail. And then you it will continue the story or end the campaign depending on it. But yeah. if you fail, the other negative, obviously, it'll be worse for you in the future. So just to talk about expansions then, effectively there's two kinds of expansions you can get. They are now available like DLC, downloadable content that you can get for the game that effectively takes all the existing components and uses them for a new set of adventures, uh, which is really nice. Now, you do have to pay for those to unlock them, but it wasn't a lot. It was like six pounds. Yeah, a few right. pounds. So yeah. maybe ten dollars if you're in America, yeah. that kind of price, um, which is very good value, I think. You know, it's not a lot more than the cost of the base, you know, on yeah. top of the cost of the base game, which is significant. but you're then reusing a lot of the things. Because I feel like we didn't use a lot of the tiles a lot. Yes. We didn't keep using the same tiles over and over again because there were so many tiles. There's a lot of variability there. And I've got a feeling that we didn't see that both sides of every tile in this entire no. campaign. So I think we held that back. We, and that's good because a lot of the ones that mentioned in Madness are small box expansions or large box expansions. So yeah. they always got a, a, certain, a high cost attributed to them. Because you can buy miniature expansion this already. Yes. Just to, I guess, to get more variation so that, for instance, you you might be limited to uh, three goblin scouts. Well, if you had six, you could have two groups of three. Well, yeah, it yeah. would be limited to what it can do. But because they're nice and small prices to add on, currently you can get even more value out of it for not very much. Yeah, so that's great. Obviously, it's Fantasy Flight. They're going to be releasing big yeah. box expansions as well. Lots of extra tiles and miniatures and cards and all the rest of it. And if you want to put lots of money into this, there's going to be tons and tons of value there in terms of time and doing the campaigns and everything else. But it's nice that you've got that kind of software expansion option. Not much money. Gives you a lot more value. Yeah, it feels like with the software, they've 
matured it now to a point where they're, the stuff they're putting out is great from day one. Like the so the yeah. save load system will work perfectly fine, no issues whatsoever. Uh, I could see it saving in the background between turns. We never had to reload, but I'm almost certain that we could just load it straight back in the scenario because yeah. it actually said it was saving. There's only one issue yeah. with the app, which we should warn you, because I, I have exactly the same issue with Mansions of Madness. It's whatever kind of software they've used to create the app. Effectively, it's the sensitivity <laughs> is a bit dodgy. So a lot of the times you'll tap on something and it just doesn't register the tap. And you're like, tap, 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 tap. Ah, <laughs> oh, finally it registered it. Yeah. And the kind of pinch zooming thing is also just a little bit, it's like oversensitive. You try and zoom it a little bit and it goes, vroom, and zooms right in. It's like, no, let's go out a bit. And it, vroom, and it goes right out again. So... That's the interaction with the touching everything is a little bit dodgy, but that is the only niggle, and it is just a niggle to be honest. It, it doesn't really affect gameplay. No, not at all. It's got nice audio in it as well. Oh, the yeah. background, it's got music's it's got great. Good music. Yeah, it suits the theme. Yeah, yeah. You've got you've got that feeling of it, uh, and yeah, it's it's just a very really solid app on top of a very good game. Yeah. So, what would your final thoughts be of, as a as a whole? I love adventure games, and and when Mountains of Mountains Second Edition came around, I was like, "Yeah, this is this is just what I want." You know, the app integration makes everything so much easier. All the bookkeeping is taken care of in terms of monster health and things like that. You know, I've got lots of monster health tokens and things. Mm. So from that point of view, it was great. But I prefer the Lord of the Rings theme. So taking that system, improving on it, I think using mm. the deck of card system and having Lord of the Rings. It just doesn't get any better. Than it. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> Had a great time throughout. Um, so yeah, it ticks, it ticks all my boxes. Fantastic. I mean, any game for me that we play a scenario, immediately want to play the next scenario, and then the next scenario yeah, yeah. after that, it, you, you just can't fault that. It has. It's so well done. The the whole product really, really just really works well together. You get so much value for money. I know it's an expensive big box. And you say, well, okay, it's not tons of miniatures, but the variation in the scenarios are quite good. Yeah. Uh, I never felt like I was redoing the same thing too much. Combat's short, sharp, quick, happens. Uh, things like you have loads of effects in the game, but because the app handles them all so well, it's really quick, easy to go, pierce, it does this. There are lots of keywords. Yes. You do have to look them up sometimes, but as you say... You can just not worry about it. If it says your weapon does pierce, yeah. you can just tap the pierce thing on the app and it does it for you. As it turns out, pierce ignores armor, but you don't actually need to know that. It will do the appropriate amount of and damage. Be and because the app works quite well, you can go... Because you can often get uh, multiple selections of how you spend your successes. Yeah. You can go, well, I select this one do pierce. Oh, that would do that much damage. Untick the pierce. I'll try the other one. So yeah. you're learning what it's doing. You're, you're not committing to doing that action, which yeah. is very really nice as well. That's great. Uh, what would you give it out of 10 then? I would give it a solid, very solid 9 out of 10. Loved it. Yeah, I have to agree. I'd give it a 9 out of 10 too. The entire adventure has been great. I was Gimli in in Eridor and it's amazing. It's original as well. Yeah. They haven't just stolen storylines from Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit or anything. It is a completely new storyline, which I really liked. You know, They've just done a great job all through. Yeah. I think, it, I think it is very good and well worth the price tag. Despite yeah. being high, yeah. it's no qualms about how much you've for it. Oh. So that has been us talking about journeys in Middle, in Middle Earth. I've been Mark Wendell. I'm Jonathan Hicks. And we've been Board Game Opinions. See you. Goodbye.